some ships, well, they're famous because of the navies they serve in. Some ships are famous because of the actions they accomplish. And some ships have neither of those things to their names, so they are not famous at all. And a good example of this is Romania's one and only cruiser. Now, yes. Normally, I would have something different to come alongside me, and it will be the normal sli uh, opening slide will be coming up, but this is what I wanted to start off with. What will be the summary slide? This is. Yeah, it's better. She is a wonderful little ship, and she's a perfect ship for a small nation, and it's a good example of the power and purpose of a small nation they have such a cruise. As she's first built, this is what she looks like. Called a sailing rig. She's capable of being used as a sailing ship and maneuvering on the sail, if a little haphazardly, as well as she is cold. And it's important to remember that when we're looking at the design of the ship, because that requirement does affect. For a small nation seeking to have a greater presence, not necessarily globally, but in the wider Black Sea, Mediterranean, and European environments, she makes a lot of sense and gives us a lot of ideas of what ships could have been. Now, for anyone, as, as usual, I'm going to announce by beginning that my notes are there. So if my eyes wander down that line, that's because they're reading my notes. Checking. I do realize, I just from the comments, people do expect me to have memorized my entirety of my notes. A. I do a lot of lecturing and a lot of videos in any week. If I memorized them all, I wouldn't have the brain power left to have normal conversations. B. As much as I love the idea that I could be infallible and memorize all that stuff, some of it would get jumbled in amongst each other and I'd get it wrong. So I like having my notes. They're a reassurance safety. Apologize if the eyes moving distract you. And yes, I know I do this lecture style rather than having the pictures come. But here is the normal <laughs> opening slide the NMS Elizabeth. 1887. She's ordered, begins construction, and launched all in the same year. Which tells you she's probably not built in Romania. She's actually been built by Ellswick. Armstrong Whitworth's yard Ellswick. So she's, in a way, considering when she's built, an Ellswick cruiser. As you've already seen, Ellsbetta is a lovely little ship. And I, I do mean this in a not condescending way. I know when you say and when you say things like a lovely little ship, that can sound condescending, but that's not what I mean. She is this ship which does so much service. So many duties. She cannot be considered anything other than a lovely little ship and value for money. And yes, she's Romania's sole cruiser. They have other ships which <clears throat> get some interesting monikers, but in terms of a cruiser, that is better. So, then we go into, what's the kind of the trip coming? Well, we're still organising that, and that's what all the super chats, super thanks, all those things, which are usually buttons down there, and Patreon, and all the other stuff, which the wonderful support I received from all of you goes towards. That is what it's going towards at the moment. Kind of the trip. Which is going to be fun. Drax is going to be there the whole way through now. Um, he had been going to fly home early. He Now he's coming out still with the main body, as I call it, which is going to be the, 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 the three which are coming out to join us to make a full time for come out on the Friday. I go out on the Thursday because I get that early morning visit to Haida, which I'm really looking forward to. 
which thanks to your support I'm going to have a special camera for. And then we go to dinner with the Canadian fans on the Saturday. We filmed Hydra properly on the Saturday. On the Sunday, well, we're going to hopefully the Canadian Aviation Museum. We're also going to Niagara Falls, maybe. And basically, I'm having fun driving around. On the Monday, we're off to hopefully the Sullivan's and the Rock. Nothing away about that one. Um, that depends on whether America allows me across the border and whether the Sullivan's is open. There's also hopefully going to be a public lecture. Hopefully. We're going to see a Blue Jays game, which is going to be fun. Um, if you see four naval historians slash is sitting in the Blue Jays game from Britain. Um, you will know who we are. We'll probably all be wearing bright coloured t-shirts and enjoying ourselves immensely. And then it's flying to Halifax. During While we're at Halifax, we're going to be looking at, of course, Sackville. But we're also, well, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm in charge of it, so I'm going to be dragging them around to look at Acadia and, of course, the Navy Museum in a dock there, as well as the Museum of the Atlantic, and probably the archives as well. So Halifax is going to be a really packed trip. Then we go back, and we're going to be hoping to do Odrua, and we're going to have a bit of a free... Uh, either Odrua is going to be on the 10th or the 11th, and then we're going to have a lecture, and I think it'll be evening, and uh, we're hopefully going to get a bit of a free time, because some point because I know me and Drac will probably be posting books back to ourselves. We'll pick up on the trip and various other things we'll pick up on the trip. But also, say this love in my heart. I'm probably gonna at several points in this trip Dra uh, make sure Drac has some time off because having been chatting with him after he's come back from his America tour, I'm responsible for him on this. He's coming with this to you know half the reason he's coming at least look out the ship the ships of course and tell me what I'm doing. But half of it he's coming is because he didn't want me to go on my own. He felt it would be nice for me to have company rather than me going off on my own. And therefore that makes me responsible for him. So I'm gonna be making sure he has good breakfasts, um get some time off well, probably by dragging him to a swimming pool and telling him to swim. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I picked the hotels we are. Thing. And, and um, you know, generally make sure he doesn't come back in quite the same collapsing state as he's returned from his America leg. I want to make sure I return him to Mrs. Drac in a proximity of the same condition I have received him in. Because, again, I, I, I love her dearly and I don't want her to be hunting seeking vengeance on me for me having broken her husband. I probably would be in pain. So, Elsbella, this is how she looks originally, without her rigging. And I always think she looks rather dashing. I find it nice that she's named for Queen Elsbella of uh, Elsbeth of Romania. Um, Elsbeth is uh, a wonderful queen of Romania. Uh, she is the wife of King Carol I, but she, when she first marries him, she is the crown princess. Uh, they marry in 1869. So by 1887, she's been queen for about six years, been in Romania for many, many years, and she's 18 years, and she has served her country as well as she can. Her adopted country. She works hard. One of the sad things for her is that um, her ch only child, Princess Maria, dies aged three in 1874. There is another picture of her, and it's the only one I can uh, the pictures I can find of her, of her really smiling, are the ones prior to her losing her child. After the smiling, after that, 
picture of my grandson in the field smiling after Charles. I've put in one of them from earlier in her reign, about 1870. But that is who she's named. The ship itself, as said, built by Armstrong Ellswick, Ellswick Cruiser. She'll be refitted at the Gajat shipyard in, like, between 1904 and 1905. Scrapped in the 1930s. Out of service in the 1920. She's laid down in 1887 May, launched in, 18, in December 1887, and completed in September 1888, and commissioned in October 1888. Now, if you want to look up, up and the, you have the, you therefore need the yard number, and that was five one six. If you want to look up her details, find her weird archives. It's a good-looking ship. Her original specs. Well, she has a four inch bulkhead forward, which is kind of interesting. Yes, this traverse back uh, bulkhead is there to protect the ship from end on fire, but also to protect her in case she rams and other things, I presume. She has a conning tower, which is quite heavily armored, and she has an armored deck. Um, she only spaces 1,351 tons and a 73 meter length and a 10 a beam and a 3.7 meter draft so she's a small ship she'd be a third rated a third a third rate cruiser in the royal navy or a sloop even uh, in theory 3000 indicated horsepower generated by four cylindrical boilers um supplying two shafts or two triple expansion engines for a top speed of 18 knots which make actually for a period she's relatively fast relatively fast please note i'm not saying fast i'm saying I do sometimes get the critique from people going, uh, you said the ship is fast and it can do No, relatively. Relatively. That means compared to competitors at time, yes, there are a few faster than her, but they're not really met that many in her size bracket. It can do quite well. Complement 140, which is, again, quite a nice size for a ship. Her duty. And there is an interesting thing. Her guns mostly are crop weapons. Now, the interesting point with them is that the Vickers, of course, went. We'll supply your. Uh, we'll supply Armstrong guns. Well, Vickers arm. Uh, we, uh, well, Armstrong, look, uh, <clears throat> said we'll supply Armstrong guns, of course. And well, Vickers also offered their guns, and lots of British manufacturers offered their guns. But the fact was, the Romanian army used German guns. And so the Romanian Navy said, right then, logistically, it makes sense for us to stick with with crop guns as well, so they use crop. And they have four single 5.9 inch guns, four single uh, 2.2 inch guns, where the 10 millimeter idea comes from, uh, four single uh, 1.5 inch guns, and four 14 inch torpedo tubes. And I should admit that if we go back quickly to this, this was called a bark rig style. Rigged in bark, which is suitable for Mediterranean black operations. She really does wander around. She's basically she goes to the opening of the Kiel Canal. She visits Stockholm, and she's inspected by King of Sweden. She does lots of cruises of the Black Sea, lots of cruises of Mediterranean in the period, and she's part of the Columbus of the eighteen ninety two Columbus celebrations at Livorno, Barcelona, and Lisbon. Goes and visits and takes part in Jerusalem. But the most famous incident today that she's part of in that period prior to World War One is probably the Tonkin. And right at the end of the incident, the Tonkin decides to they make a break for it and they go to Constanta in Romania to try and get freedom. And basically, her role in that is you can't do much against us. We don't have anything that can do much against this battleship, so we have to sort of. But she's the Royal, uh, she's the Romanian Navy presence. She deals with the torpedo boat, the Ismail, which was part of the Tonkin. And um, yeah, she is part of that. A uh, part of that. She's an important part from the Romanian perspective. I do love the way when you're looking at some of the writing up and some of the reports. Basically, if you call, uh, 
there's a great line on this. Here's it's repeated in Wikipedia, but it comes from an actual book. It comes from Bascom's account. And Bascom, of course, Neil Bascom writes this sort of this whole thing about about a book about the pumpkin pump and he says she plays no significant part. And I can understand why he's writing under from his perspective, because she doesn't fire her guns or anything, but her presence is the significant part. It's the Romanian Navy's largest, most powerful ship. Yeah, does it match up against the Tonkin? No. But the fact that they have her there is showing willingness. It's what they have to show willingness. So she's there. And I'd say that's pretty significant from a Romanian perspective. Not from the incident perspective or from the whole the sort of the battleship turning up perspective. But it's significant that she's there. Then, of course, she goes in for her refit. Now, it's kind of an interesting one because it's Dallas Shipyard 1904 to 95 is theoretically the refit, but her big changes of armament take longer to filter in. So we can say it's a 1904 to 95 refit, but it's really 1907 that the refit is completed. And by that point, the armament has now become four single 120, 4.7 guns. Uh, these guns are um, interesting because they are French Saint Chamon weapons, as are the 75mm, the 3 inch gun, and it retains her 14 inch torpedoes. Everything else stays the same, but you add her guns. This is an interesting point. Why was she having her guns upgraded? And why did she need them upgraded? Well,. Theoretically, the 75mm and the 20s were better for her role. And the 37mm were removed completely without replacement because, frankly, you needed this. What's her role at this point, though? What is her military role? Honestly, it's anything small than her, she's supposed to be able to beat up, but. Anything larger than her, she's got her torpedoes to try and deter, and she can't really run away, so mostly she's, if she's fighting something massive in 1907, remember, HMS Dreadnought is now in the world, and other people are building Dreadnought battleships, there isn't really much chance of her surviving. But! She is a present. And that's the point. Having the modernized guns gives her more present, because... It shows commitment to her, which shows commitment to the Navy, which shows commitment to your presence, which shows your presence around the world. That's the point. It's one of those things when someone tries to be firm and they go, and you go, well, are you really? It, uh, it's like the Royal Navy at the moment, fitted for, not with, uh, surface to surface missiles is coming up front of us. And there's lots of debates over whether we're going to have surface to surface missiles. You, if you send a warship into a scenario and it hasn't even got a surface-to-surface -surface missile, what are you going to interpret? That ship might be the most modern, powerful ship you can see. Yes, it's got the capabilities, but they're all defensive. One of the interesting things when you consider the next generation of Royal Navy ships, Type 26 and Type 21s, with Mark 41 VLS coming in and the strike length strike length tubes. Well, that was originally an option for upgrade on the Type 45s, but they're getting c septic so they're becoming even more defensive instead. You'd actually, honestly, if you're being honest, you'd like the c to be fitted, I know I would, but I'd also like Mark 41 VLS fitted in that space. In fact, I prefer Mark 41 VLS fitted in that space, and they found another space to stick in the Mark the, uh, Deceptors off the Type 23s. Why? Because I would like the increase in surface to air missiles, but I'd also like the strike length tubes. Because if we're going to dilly dally around on anti ship missiles, hopefully a long range land attack missile, long range strike missile that can fit in that VLS, which has a secondary anti ship capability, would be useful. But the thing is, that's the modern example of this. This was taking a ship which was older, 
everyone understood the reality of it. But actually fitting it with something which was viable. A viable weapon system. So, yes, it's still a token system. Token military capability in some respects. A single ship and it's not really that amazing. But it shows your commitment to that, which therefore shows what you're doing. It's the thing you have to think about when you're doing procurement. You have to think about what are you showing in your procurement choices. Fitted for, not with, shows you're not really taking it seriously. You're fitting it, uh, you're fitting it for, so you're playing lip service to it. Fitting it with, not with, shows you really don't care. Fitting with something shows it actually is a serious threat. Fitting a ship with new guns and upgrading it shows you're taking the threat seriously, you're trying to do things as best you can, but you're on a budget. You're a smaller part, so that's understandable. From a smaller part, that's still a big commitment, that upgrade. And that's important for when she takes part in the Balkan War. She's sent to Istanbul and she lands 130 Romanian Marines. 15 are sent to the Romanian legation, 15 to the Romanian consulate, and 100 are put into the outer sector of the city, which had been allotted to Romania. Also, she landed the naval party, who took part in extinguishing a large fire and were present at the funeral of Sefkat Pasha. She stayed in Istanbul, almost was there from almost the beginning, and only leaves it in July 1913. It's pretty much the end of the war. That's a big commitment, and that's present for a small nation during the First Balkan War. And this is a war which is, as I said, has shown, it's illustrated by far larger ships. You know, we have the Greek flagship there, which was the Georgios Avrov, the armoured cruiser here, and Turkish Ottoman flagship, the uh, Barbaros Heron. Yeah. These are far bigger, far more powerful ships. And the Georgios Avrov, it's 10,000 tons in standard, 10,400 tons for the boat same size depth as a county class. The the Turkish ship had started out as the Kufrest Friedrich Wilhelm, I of the German, and displaced the self. Roughly 10,600 tons were loaded. Big ships. And yet, this little ship is still able to have a big impact and a big presence thanks to the forces she deploys and she supports for a small nation. So for, uh, it's a very cost effective deployment. And it also means that they can withdraw at any point they need. They just load them on the ship. By World War I, her stats have changed again, and in World War I, she has some in very interesting roles. Between World War I, uh, between the First Balkan War and World War I, she of course does take part in the Second Balkan War, where she defends the mouth of the Danube. Basically, her duty is to sit there and uh, make sure nothing goes wrong in the mouth of the Danube, which is critical to the Romanian economy. Um, but her main armament is stripped off her to form a coastal battery on the Danube River. Protection against possible attacks by Austro-Hungarian river monitors. Um, as the war go, when the war starts, and so she remains in Salina under Captain Nicole Kekestru for the duration of the war, reinforcing the port's anti-aircraft defence using her seventy-five millimeter guns for modified anti-aircraft, and also retained her torpedo tubes and her machine gun for that. Work. Torpedo tubes were basically there just in case you needed to do something actually on the surface. But, you know, that's her fit in World War One, 
And during World War One, she shoots down, or at least takes part in the shoot down, of a Friedrichshafen F uh, Friedrichshafen FF thirty three seaplane during the spring of nineteen seventeen. German vessel. The pilot managed to land his aircraft on the water, but is subsequently taken prisoner. One of the rumors is by boats launched. She's taken out of service, as said, in 1920. Then used as a barrack ship at Galajat, and then later to Galena for 10 years. Well, 6 years. Sold as scrap in 1926. Theoretically. Still used in service as a barrack ship until 1929. It's kind of a weird thing. And that scrapping finally takes place in the 1930s. It happened. So what's her value? Why am I giving you a mm, 30 slash uh, 30 plus minutes talk on this small ship which doesn't do much apart from be there at instant and be upgraded? Because guess what? That's what a cruiser offers a small but power. It's the chance to be involved. Romania was able to be part of peace negotiations was a relevant player in international events because she could turn up. And because she could turn up, she had a voice at the table. Did she turn up with something particularly big and impressive? No. But did she turn up with something which showed her commitment? Yes. Upgrading her showed her commitment. It kept her relevant. And we can tell her actual military capability because Let's be honest, by the time the First World War runs around, when she's 20 plus years old, what they do, they land her primary guns, which they've only put on her a few years earlier, as a, as a battery, and she basically becomes a floating anti-aircraft. But she does well. She still has a purpose. I'm not sure what a torpedoes were for. I suppose if anyone tried to force them out of the river, they would have found torpedoes flying at them. Or maybe there was just no point in taking them. Uh, uh, no point in taking them off. But what matters is she has the capability. She's there. She's a presence, and that's what Romania needs from. Her. These days, we get so hung up on the military fighting capabilities of cruisers. And warships, we forget their peacetime roles. We forget their value there as present ships. And forget their value as warships. It's more than just fighting in a war. The Elzebeta is an example of what, it's, uh, what it is by, uh, to fight. She wages peace as successfully as Romania. Is she a massive fleet? Is she going to win them leadership of the world? No. But is she going to turn up and force major powers to think about Romania? Yes, because they have to. But she's there. They can't ignore her. There are other powers which don't have such ships. They are completely ignored. Elsbetta is a protected cruiser. She's 1,351 tons of Romanian presence wherever they need her in the world. She does it well. She does it well. She's not going to set the world afire for design. Doesn't need to. She is an example of we've built a good quality. Going to off the shelf. Be the modern crazy. And that actually makes me think she's something which needs to be remembered more. And that's also a great reason why a lot of other ships aren't. 
They remembered because, not remembered as I said at the beginning. He wasn't part of a famous navy. He not doesn't do famous action. So she's forgotten. But in many ways, that's what warships are supposed to be. The warships which are remembered are remembered because of the things they do which are out of the ordinary. Alvera is forgotten because she does the ordinary day-to-day -day jobs required of warships very well. The presence mission does. The deployment mission does to it. The training cruises, the flag waving she does with tea. That's her value. There is going to be some people who are going to come back and go, well, you could do all those roles with an unarmed, flag an unarmed flagship or a royal yacht. Not really. Because, in the nicest way, turning up for a present mission in a royal yacht is great if you're a navy which has a whole host of ships which have guns. Because that's a special ship. But if you're a nation which doesn't have a lot of ships with guns, and a lot of ships... You know, missiles don't really make the point. How terrible. Missiles sit there in a box. The Russian missiles tend to sort of stick out because of these huge things sticking aside, so they do sort of draw your eye. But most modern missiles sit in a box in the deck. And that's just not impressive. It doesn't strike your image. Whenever you're looking for the cool photos of ships, they're usually focused in down the gun. And whenever you go to a diplomatic event held on the warship, trust me, everyone will be wanting to take their pictures with one of three things. They will go up to the bridge and want to have their photo taken on the captain's chair. They don't want to go down to engineering. It's oily, greasy, and they'll get their party and their nice clothes dirty. People like me will want to go down engineering, but we're weird. They all want to take their photo with a helicopter, especially if you have one sitting on the back of the flight deck, because helicopters are cool. And possibly the most popular photo opportunity on a ship is going to be dun -dun -dun, the main gun at the front. There will be a queue. There will be groups. Of There'll be people who want to put their arms around the gun. There'll be people who want to dangle from the gun. There'll be people who want to pose in front of the gun. You can pretty much have a sailor there all the time going, would you like your photo taken? Because they will be doing that all evening, and it's a good way to watch the guests while also looking like part of the party. Alzbara carried enough guns that looked cool enough that she could do all that. And the trouble is, for making a royal yacht work, you really have to have a royal family of people care enough about or going to sea. It's one reason why they don't work with politicians on them. Politicians, unless they're epoch straddling politicians, don't really have the same draw as the magical thing, the title of royal family, do. It's funny. If ever you're, you've been near a British royal tour abroad, there are people who are ardent Republicans who hate the entirety, would hate a royal family in their own country. But the moment they get near it, yes, ma'am. Of course, ma'am. It's funny to watch. Anyway, so what we've got coming up. Um, ooh, this is a bit out of date, but not that out of date. We've got the Finnish War of 1808-9. Yeah, that's going to be a fun one. That's going to be on Thursday. You're going to enjoy that. Right. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoyed the discussions. I hope you like the rest of the cruises coming up. Uh, next week, we have the Galaxy class, and then it's the Bodicea class. It's going to be fun. And then we start getting into all the recordings while I'm away. Hopefully, they're all done. They should all be done. Take care. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed.